I'm in two weeks here, 14 days in, uh, 14 days going strong. Um, we are excited for that. We did our, our, our we went to Daytona Beach for four days, and then we hopped on a cruise for eight days out of uh, Cape Canaveral, Port Canaveral. It's like an hour before, uh, an hour under Daytona Beach. If you go to Daytona Beach, you just keep driving an hour south. We went Cape Canaveral, and then we hopped on a cruise ship for eight days. Has anybody been on a cruise before? Just curious. I love cruises. You can eat as much food as you want, when you want, uh, and with pretty much no shame. You can just eat as much food as you want. And this cruise ship, uh, there were five sea days. So it was an eight-day cruise, five sea days. So five of those days of the eight, we were in the middle of the ocean, just floating around, traveling from place to place. But the three places we stopped at was Aruba, Bonaire, and Grand Turk. Uh, beautiful places, like Aruba, Bonaire, Grand Turk. Beautiful beaches, water crystal clear, and you can put on a snorkel and see fish swimming under you. Like beautiful sunshine, no rain, no humidity. Like it was a beautiful, beautiful place. So how you get to either Aruba, Bonaire, or Grand Turk, like how you explore the island is the boat would dock uh, on a dock called the port, like the boat port, the cruise port. And then you get off this really, 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 really big dock into the port area. In the port area, it's almost like you're walking into a mall, like an outdoor mall, super big on tourism. Like right when you get off the, the dock, you, there's a restaurant, there's a pool, there's the beaches, there's like a, the t-shirts you can buy, like it's very big on merch and tourism. Cruise ships make up the main economy in these areas. So you've got like, especially with two boats are there, the big day, you got like 10,000 people coming with a wad of cash to buy a t-shirt that says, my name is Aruba. Like there's just a, a big tourism in, in Aruba, by the Grand Turk. But we, we wanted to explore a little bit more of those islands. So we rented a van and had like the local tour guide take us around the whole island. So we were seeing like donkeys, the, the views, we got the pet of donkeys, which was pretty cool. But as we were touring the island, there was a big shift when we left the port to when we actually got into the main island, big shift. When we were, we were on the van going through the island, it, had, it reminded me of a, a Guatemala mission trip. I've been to Guatemala, like Guatemala, about four or five times on a mission trip. And these islands that once you got off the boat was so beautiful with the beaches and the restaurants and the pools and the stores and the ice cream, so beautiful, so amazing, so well established. The moment we got outside of it, the actual island itself, I was like, man, like this is totally different. Like what's going on here? But in, in Grand Turk, there's actually a gate blocking off the tourism part, the port part, from the actual island. Like there was a sign that says, you are leaving the guarded port if you go into the island. So I was like, man, I'm here to explore the island. That's because cruise ships and developers will dump millions and millions of
of Jesus and merged it and then say I'm a Christian, nobody would question it. I'm good. If I said I read my Bible this week, but nobody, everybody's going to believe me. Nobody's going to question, okay, hey, what chapter or verse did you learn? They just, oh, man, that's how I read the Bible. Okay, it's Jesus. Like, we just claim to be it to put on an appearance as we're a part of it. Nobody's going to question it. That's how you get this huge statistic of 68% of people, which is awesome. But now I would love to know the statistic of how many people are actually following Jesus. Tonight we're talking about the outward appearance. And I hope that we see what God has to say about the outward appearance. Like, that's the one thing we need to know tonight. Like, you would forget everything else. We just need to know one thing. We need to know what God has to say about focusing on the outward appearance. About just putting, dumping tons of money, resources, your time, your efforts on just one specific area of your life to make everybody think you're, you're, you got it all together, then the rest of our life is in shambles. We're trying to hide something. So tonight I hope you see how crucial it is to have your heart connected to Jesus, but I also see how, I also hope you see how much peace you can have. Like a, a supernatural amount of peace to know you don't have to prove yourself to be loved by Jesus by our appearance change. You don't have to prove or chase Jesus' approval by doing outward appearance things. Tonight we're going to see two things. We're going to see that God sees through the smoke screen and that God looks at the heart. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. Uh, it's 1 Samuel, not 2 Samuel. We make it to 2 Samuel, but in reverse to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel is in the Old Testament. And first, the book of 1 Samuel was written by Samuel. Samuel was a prophet. So prophets, mainly you see a lot of them in the Old Testament. Prophets were people that God chose to speak through. So God would choose, yeah, hey, I'm going to speak to Samuel directly. And then God would give me a message to Samuel to say, hey, everybody go to McDonald's after the mission. Then Samuel would take that message from God and then broadcast it to whoever God chose to broadcast it to. Could be one individual, could be a large number of people. So prophets were how was a way that God used to spread a message. They spoke and communicated directly with God and that they relayed the messenger. They were, the, they were a messenger for God. Samuel was a, he was like a big, like one of the dudes. Like Samuel, heroes of faith, hall, hall of fame, one of the dudes. Well-respected prophet. You're going to see when we read this, well-respected. Just one of the dudes. And Samuel, he had a task of finding who the next king of the Israelites was. Israelites, like Moses, goes to Pharaoh, hey, let the people go. Then the Israelites are free from the Egyptians, they're wandering around. Samuel was tasked to find a king for the Israelites. He found this guy named Saul. Saul was a king for 40 years. Then God gave Samuel a message to tell Saul. It's like a lot of gossip, pretty much. We're trying to describe how a prophet works with people. It's like just spilling tea. God gives Samuel a message to Saul. He says, hey, Samuel, you need to tell Saul to lead the people this way. Samuel gives the message to Saul. Saul doesn't just do it. God's God, so he knows about it. God goes back to Samuel and says, hey, you need to tell him this. I'm rejecting him as king. Samuel goes to Saul and says, hey, God has rejected you as the king. Saul's no longer king. Samuel's on a mission to find the next king. Is everybody with me? Everybody's good. Yeah, it's like still tea. You guys love that. You're like, oh my God, what's the drama? Like, who's getting called out? Who's, who's being rejected as king? So now Samuel's on a mission to find the next king. King. And that's where we're at in 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. Let's read it together. The Lord says to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Remember, so Samuel anointed Saul. So now Saul, Samuel is kind of sad with how it ended with him and Saul. There's some beef between them. It did not go well. Samuel's like, man, that's the guy. I anointed him, and now he's not king anymore. He's like, God's like, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? Since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Beth Bethlehem. Jesse was just a farmer and a sheep breeder in Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Verse 2, but Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. There's beef between Samuel and Saul because Samuel told Saul, hey, God said you can't be king anymore. Like God has rejected you. So there's some beef there. Verse 3, God says, hey, this is how you're going to make it happen. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me, the one I indicate. So Samuel's like, hey, God, what do you want me to do? There's some beef going on here. God's like, hey, take a, take a heifer with you or a baby calf, and you're going to use it as a sacrifice to invite Jesse to this sacrifice. And then at the sacrifice, there's going to be a lot of people there. This is a holy, sacred moment. At this sacrifice, pretty much at this bonfire that we're making a sacrifice unto the Lord, I'm going to indicate somebody to be the next king. This 
So we see Jeff Jones right now write this down, that God sees through the smoke. That's our first point. We'll do two points tonight. It's that God sees through the smoke screen. A smoke screen to, to kind of play that out. It's a, a football term, right? Uh, uh, the offensive team, the team with the football, trying to score a touchdown, will have plays pretty much called smoke screen. We're going to have a lot of people running around, you know, motions behind the back, doing like creating a lot of distractions. It's called a smoke screen. So the defense doesn't see where the ball is. A lot of trick plays, reverses, people running around trying to hide the ball to distract the defense from where the ball is. It's also the military uses it. It's called a smoke grenade. You ever play Call of Duty or, you know, watch any type of army show? They throw a grenade or a firework, throw out a smoke bomb. You create smoke to distract the enemy on where you're trying to go. It's a smoke screen. God sees through the smoke screen. That the, the smoke screen is a strategy or device to used to distract everyone from what else is really happening. And God sees right through it. Right? Verse 3, God says, Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint the one I indicate. Remember the Samuel chapter. Right? Samuel's a little nervous. He's already on the edge that Saul's going to kill him. He's already, you know, he already anointed Saul. It didn't work out that well. So he's like, man, there's going to be a lot of people at this bonfire at the sacrifice. Like, God, how do I know? Which one is supposed to be the king? Like, this is a big deal. This isn't like trying to find an intern for Starbucks. Like, this is the king to lead a lot of people. Really, really influential position. Samuel has a, a, a very, really big task to fulfill. Really big decision to make. Really big moment. Like, God, who's going to be the king? There's a lot of stuff lying around. I already got one guy trying to kill me. Didn't end well. Like, there's a lot of smoke. And God says, hey, look, I'm going to indicate this. Like, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to put a spotlight on the guy that you're going to be the pick. Like, God sees through the smoke screen. Like, all the distraction, all the worry, all the thoughts, all the things, God sees right through it. He's like, hey, Samuel, I'm going to put a spotlight on the person you need to fix. Like, I'm going to let you know. Because God sees through the smoke screen. God knows more, and this means that God knows more than we do. Like, he's God, but we're not. God didn't go to Samuel and say, hey, look, Samuel, figure it out, man. Like, I trust you. No, like, God sees through it all. Like, God is a sovereign. Like, he, he sees the future, and he knows every possible scenario that's going to happen, and chooses the one that he wants to play out according to his will, and says, hey, we're going to do that. And then Samuel goes and does it. Like, he knows more than us because he can see through the smoke screen. Right? How many times have, been, have any of us prayed that prayer? Like, kind of putting ourselves in the, the shoes of Samuel. Like, God, how do I know, like, especially in relationships, how do I know if he's the one? How do I know if she's the one? I don't know if this is the job to take. I don't know if this is the career path to go down. Like, God, how do I know if this is the decision I need to make? How do I know if they're the one? Like, wouldn't it be so much easier if God just put a flashlight on the person we should marry or the job we should take or the degree we should take? Like, God just put a spotlight on it and said, hey, do that. It'd be super easy, right? It'd be awesome. But we see here in his character that he actually did that. Like, God did that. He told Samuel, I'm going to indicate it. I'm going to give you the spotlight. And as we keep reading, we're going to see that God is a man of his word. So it's in God's character to actually provide that way. If you go, if you go to God and say with it, so many times this is where we fumble the ball. We go to God and pray, God, all right, God, how do I know? Is this the right decision? Are they the one? Is she the one? Is this the right thing to do? What do we do? We go to God. Awesome. But then we just stop there. We don't actually listen to what he says and then follow through with it. We just go to God and we're free. But Samuel here, he goes to God and we're going to see that he follows through with what he says, you go to God, stay with it, stay committed. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Samuel, right here, is in all his ways, trusting in God. So if you are leaning on your own understanding, don't do that. Because God sees through the smoke screen. And this is where the, the, the peace and faith comes in. Right? If we pray and go to God, like, what do I do? Big thing, big decisions we make. I have to go to this sacrifice. Who's going to be the king? Gosh, I date this person, marry this person, take this job, take this career, move out here, take out student loans. God, what do I do? If we take the time to go to God, to, to not lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him, and we do what he tells us to do, there's a lot of peace that comes from that. That no matter what happens, no matter which way the ball rolls in the situation, you're doing what God is trusting. Like, man, that's, there's so much peace can walk that. Like, hey, it's not on you. But you can flip a finger out. Like, hey, God, this is God's time. And we just got to follow that path. There's much peace that comes from that. 
so much peace that comes from that. How do you know if it's God's way? First, we have the Bible. We have the Word. We have the Bible. We can read this. If you have a situation or a decision that you don't know what to do, start with reading this. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. We can read this and then follow this, and then we can pray and we can bring a biblical community into this decision to let them speak into it. James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, which is all of us probably, <laughs> including me, if any of us lacks wisdom, you should what? Ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Like, hey, you got a big decision to make? Do not lean on your own understanding, but go and ask God for wisdom. Go ask God for wisdom. And this helps us because we know that God sees through this smoke screen. But this is why it's really, really, really important. This is why God sees through this smoke screen. Right now we're saying that you see it play out. It's important that he sees right through it. That through all the distractions, you can throw a grenade, pop smoke, try to hide behind it. If God sees through it, it's because we cannot hide behind our own smoke screen. Like, you can't hide behind your own smoke screen. You can create a distraction all you want. You can show up at the church, put a couple verses in your Instagram bio, and post an Instagram reel, get some nice Jesus merch, rock the outfit. And you can, you can fool everybody and distract everybody from what's going on. You can, just like the cruise ships, you can dump a lot of money into one strategic area of your life. But the moment somebody goes past that gate, it's like, man, this, this ain't had enough. Like you're showing me on the outward, the way you outwardly live your life, you're following Jesus. But the moment I step behind that gate, it's different. It's, it's a smoke screen. That's why 68% of people claim to be Christian. It's a smoke screen. Like, hey, all I got to do is claim to be it. And then uh, rock the appearance, and nobody's going to question it. If I can just claim to be a Christian, have an outward appearance, but nobody questions it, that's easy, man. No sacrifice, no hurdles to jump over, no abiding I have to do, no surrendering. But it's a smokescreen, and we're hiding behind it. But God sees right through it. God sees right through it. We can play those games all day long. Like, we can, you can fool every human on this planet. Like you can you can you can hide behind a smoke screen appearing you have it all, and you can fool every human on this planet. You can fool me. You can fool your parents, your brothers, your sisters. You can fool every human on this planet, but you will not be able to fool God because He sees through the smoke screen. God sees right through it. If your heart is not surrendered and connected to Jesus, you have a very serious reality to wrestle with. When I read the Bible, and we read. Bible. We see many, 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 many warnings, multiple warnings about what God has to say about a smoke screen. Like when we read this, we see many, many, many warnings about going a tree by its fruit, putting on a form of godliness, but denying his power, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Like we can see many warnings about sometimes something to do with an outward appearance but our heart not connected with Jesus. Many warnings that God tells us that, hey, you can you can stack as many chairs in church as you want, you can be the loudest, you can be the Raise your, high, raise your hand the highest in worship. Read the Bible the fastest. You can have good morals. All these outwardly things, which are amazing. But this not coming from a heart that's connected to Jesus. And all that is a bunch of good things. And God sees right through that smoke screen. So what we should do, if we need to, repent of your sin. Surrender your heart to Jesus and follow him. He sees right through. And also trust in God. If you're like Samuel right now, in the middle of a big moment, trust in God, pray for wisdom daily, and abide in Him. Let's keep reading verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said. <laughs> Would you get that, right? Samuel goes to God, like, God, I'm not going to know what to do. God's like, all right, hey, get this sacrifice and invite Jesse to it. I'm going to put a spotlight on the guy you should pick. What does Samuel do? He doesn't just say, okay, great, I'm going to figure it out now. Samuel does what the Lord says. Like there's some there's some recurring things here that we can have we can be strategic and wise about. That hey, if we go to God and ask Him what to do, do what He says. Right? Samuel, verse four. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. Remember, Samuel, prophet, very respected guy, like a holy fear. So these people are like, hey, this guy is ready to like, you know, kick names and butt for the name of Jesus. Like he's about to like slay this whole town. Or is he here to like make a sacrifice? Like, what's going on here? Samuel's very big, respected guy. They're asking his name, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourself, which means cleanse yourself, purify yourself, separate yourself from anything that is unclean, and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited him to the sacrifice. Remember Jesse, 
Jesse's the dude. God told Samuel to be on the lookout for him. So here comes Jesse back to play, verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw a lake and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed one stands here before the Lord. Verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord has not looked at the things people look at. People look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Second and last point for tonight. God looks at the heart. Right, Samuel, he goes to the sacrifice. He's like, all right, Jesse, here's your son. He goes in. Then he lays eyes on the lake. Then he has confidence. He's like, all right, yeah, surely this guy is it. Surely he's the one ready to be king to lead all these people. He probably looks like a king. He's tall. God says, no, it's not because of his height. Like, he's probably, I'm thinking like Jason Momoa, Dwayne Johnson. Like, he looks like a king. He's ready to, like, lead some people, lead some soldiers in battle. But God's like, wait, no. Man, if this doesn't sum up pretty much everybody or all of our relationship problems, big decision problems, is that the first thing we see that looks legit, we're there. Like, oh man, this, this is it. Like, this guy, this girl, man, they're pretty, they're good. All right, God, is this it? Just like Samuel with the lake. Like, oh man, surely they look like it. Surely they are claiming to be it. They put on an outward appearance to fit the description. So it, it must make sense. And that's why we, we get in failed relationships, people get hurt, we make bad decisions jump in head first purely of what we see on the outside what we see on the outside but this is the, the best relationship advice of the week look at what god looks at right verse seven the lord does not look at the things that we as human looks at for people look on the outward appearance but the lord looks at the heart so this is where peace comes in right god does, if god doesn't even look on the outward appearance we don't have to be stressed and anxious about winning his approval by doing good things and solely just good things. Right here, after everybody leaves, there's going to be about 100 chairs to, to put back. If I stayed behind to 1 a.m. to put all these chairs back, I'm like, God, look at me. I served your church. I stayed and unstacked 100 chairs. I was here at the church till 1 a.m. Like, God, look at me. I, I did better than all of them. I did this really great thing and served the church. God's like, okay, cool. All you did was get tired. And we can do these good things, but if our heart's not there with what God sees through that smoke screen, if our heart's not with it, if our heart is not fueling it, if our heart is not the foundation of it, our heart being surrendered or connected to Jesus, then we're just doing good things. Those good things are good. But if we're assuming that it's fueling our relationship with Jesus, we're deceiving ourselves. But there can be so much more peace. You know that if I don't stack 100 of these chairs, or just one of these chairs, my heart is to serve Jesus. Serve his church, he's not counting the number of chairs. He's looking at my heart. But now, if my heart is to serve the church and to serve Jesus, then the quantity probably is not even going to matter. But he's looking at my heart. He sees through the smoke screen. And that can bring a lot of peace. Right? We can read, you can be the, the fastest person to read your Bible. A book a day, a book of the Bible a day. You can be done in 66 days. You can be the slowest person to read your Bible. You could be doing the, the Bible for a year plan for 10 years now. But God's looking at your heart. But we get tripped up when we start to compare our walk with other people's walk based off the outwardly appearance things. And God's like, time out, man. I'm looking at your heart. If your heart is connected to me, is surrendered to me, and it's from that these good things are happening, let's go. I'm looking at your heart. That's so much more peace that could also slow you. You don't have to chase his approval by doing good you have a connected, your heart is connected to him and surrendered to him, which fuels you doing good things. So it should bring us a lot of peace, but it should also make us, also give us a holy fear. Right? God looking at our heart, and just judging our heart. Awesome. A lot of peace in that. Other side of that coin, that should give us a holy fear. Like, man, God, you're looking at my heart, which means I can pull everybody in the room and unstack all these chairs, but God, you're looking at my you can see right through the smoke screen no matter how many people I can trick. Like, that makes me tremble sometimes. Like, God, you know the thoughts, the impure thoughts, the impure ways, the bad motive in my heart sometimes. Like, God, you see it all. And that makes me tremble sometimes. God cares about why you do what you do rather than what you do. That God cares about your motive behind what you do rather than what you're doing. He's looking at your heart. He cares about why you do what you're doing versus what you're doing. You can be doing an amazing thing, but with a bad motive. You can have the right motive, but what appear outwardly not be an amazing thing, but God's like, hey, your heart's connected to me. I'm looking at your heart. I don't see what people see. I'm looking at your heart. So if you 
bring a lot of peace, but also bring us a lot of a, a holy fear. That we should examine our hearts. That our heart is not connected and surrendered to Jesus. God sees that and he knows that. And that gives us a very scary reality to wrestle with. I'm not God, I can't determine anybody's eternal destination by any means. I can just say that if you have not repented and confessed your sins and believed in Jesus, then the only eternal destination is hell. So we have a connected, surrendered heart to Jesus. Not hourly piercing, a connected, surrendered heart to Jesus, which then fuels everything else. Like, come home. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Come home, my child. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. Then Jesse called uh, Abinab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Verse 9, Jesse then had Shema pass, but Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to them, The Lord has not chosen these. So we asked Jesse, like, all, are all your sons here? But right now there's pretty much a runway of auditions of who's going to be king. Like Jesse's all right, hey, all right, guys, line up, let's go, Alay. Like, you fit the description, you look good, you look great. Let's send another son through, another son through, another son through. Samuel's like, yeah, God has not chosen one of these. It's pretty much just a, a runway audition. Samuel's wife and left for any of these people to be king. And then Samuel asks Jesse, you got, any, you got anybody else? God's not picking any of these people. God's not picking anybody that you would think would be king by his hourly appearance. So then he asks Jesse, are all your sons here? There's still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. He will not sit down until he arrives. So he as in Jesse sent for him and had brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. The Lord said, hey, look, Samuel, from day one, I'm going to indicate it. Like, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to put a spotlight on the person. You need to pick this king. Just do what I'm going to tell you to do and follow through with it. Don't get distracted. Don't get caught in the smoke. We have a lot of people pass in front of you. Don't get caught in the smoke. I see right through it. I'm God. You're not. So then this guy walks in. God says, rise and anoint him. He's the one. That's the spotlight. That's the indicator. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And Samuel went to Ramah. David, this is David and Goliath. David. This is before David defeated Goliath. David was a young guy, a young boy, just now anointed as king. A lot of people passed by first. The least likely based on outwardly appearance. But God looks at the heart. He knows David's heart. He knows the heart of the eight other people that passed in front of him. God knows the heart. And God did what he said he was going to do. He told Samuel, I'm going to indicate, I'm going to tell you who to pick. And then verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. Then the Lord followed through. There's an equation here fueled by faith. We go to God, and God say, like, God, who's the one? What do I need to do? What job? What career? What boyfriend? What girlfriend? What student loans? What credit card? Like, oh, what do I got to do here? And then we take a step back, like, no, I'm going to handle it my own way. We get caught in the smoke, and then we get burnt in our own fire. But if we're like saying, well, like, hey, let's just do what God said. And God's a man of his word. So to summarize these two points, God sees through the smoke. Right? Just trust in him in all your ways and acknowledge him, and he will give you the wisdom. Don't hide behind your own smoke. Because you're going to get yourself burned. I mean, you can fool everybody here. You can fool me. Right? But if you are here tonight and your heart is not connected to Jesus and surrendered to Jesus according to the Bible, that is a very scary reality of the end destination of hell. And that's we should examine our hearts. Don't get me wrong. It is very amazing to do, very amazing, good grammar, very amazing to do good things. Right? James says, faith without works is dead. It's awesome to do good things. But if the foundation of wanting to do good things is to achieve Jesus or to achieve heaven or to achieve anything, God's like, no, you're saved by grace through faith, not a result of works, not by doing good things or an outwardly appearance. But if the foundation is a heart surrendered to Jesus, connected to Jesus, and then from that good things are happening, that's, that's amazing. That's where good things are awesome. When we, uh, when we went on this cruise, the, the very first stop to at least get on the boat, it was kind of like an airport. We went through a lot of a lot of security checks. Right? We first had to get our passport to leave the country, and then we had to get a uh, take our picture to get a ship uh, a sea pass or a ship pass.
class, um, and that C pass was pretty much your lifeline for the whole group. It linked to your, your bank account, it was your ID, it was your money, your IV, your room key, it was your lifeline for the entire crew. So every time you would leave a port, like you would leave Aruba, you would scan your C pass so they would know, hey, Josh Hanushek has left Aruba. Let's make sure Josh Hanushek gets back on the boat before the boat leaves Aruba. So you're right, you scan your C pass, leave Aruba, you're on the island, and you come back off Aruba, and you scan your C pass and get on the boat. But what if, what if I was just a, a local on the island of Aruba? I saw this big boat, I'm like, man, that's awesome. I want to get on that boat. And I just walked up to the boat, and I just claimed to be a cruiser on the boat. And I had my flip-flops on, my bathing suit, you know, a nice sunny, you know, uh, beach flannel. I, I looked and I had the appearance of somebody who would fit the description to be on the cruise. I said, hey, look, man, I'm going, I'm going through security checks. Hey, look, I claim to be a cruise. Like, I'm supposed to be on the Carnival Body Car. Like, I claim to be on there. Do I not look like one? I got the, the flip-flops, the bathing suit, the sunglasses, the bucket hat. Like, let me on the boat. He would say, okay, cool. Where's your seat pass? Like, no, I don't have to. No, but you claim to be on the seat. And, and in life, you can pretty much claim to be something and put on an outwardly appearance and nobody's going to question it. School, with grades, with sports, you can claim to be something, put on an outwardly appearance, nobody's going to question it. With sin, you can claim to be an alcoholic, put on an appearance of drinking alcohol, nobody's probably going to question it. You can claim to be homosexual, and then put on an appearance of a homosexual, and nobody's going to question it. You, just about anywhere in life, you can get by by claiming to be something, or identifying with it, and put on an outwardly appearance, nobody questions it. Here with Christianity. You go to God and say, God, I claim to be a Christian. Do I not look like one? Let me get into heaven. He says, okay, cool. where's your tickets? Where's your seat back? Say, no, I just claim to be one. Like, I should be in. Like, I claim to be one. Say, no. Depart from me, for I never knew you. All right, Matthew 7, these people go to God. They did many, 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 many good things. They claimed to be it. Did a lot of good things. They prophesied in the name of Jesus. They casted out demons in the name of Jesus. They did mighty good things in the name of Jesus. But Jesus said, depart from me, for I never knew that's what I hope we see tonight. I'm not trying to, to use a fear tactic here by any means, but just like, hey guys, we gotta wake up, man. Like this 68% statistic, awesome. But don't let it lead you astray. Don't be one of the 68 that think, man, as long as I claim to be it and fill out a survey, I'm good. We need to connect our hearts and surrender our hearts to Jesus and know that he is faithful and just to forgive us. That while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. That he actually wants your heart. The dirty, messed up heart that you don't want to tell anybody else about. The thoughts you don't want to tell anybody else about. The emotions you don't want to tell anybody else about. Because they're so dirty and so nasty. Nobody else can see about it or hear about it. Jesus is like, yes, I knew all that. And I still chose to die for you. Would you surrender your life to me? If you do that, man, that's where heaven is. That's where eternal salvation is. And that's my prayer for us. Tonight, that if you were here, that I want to ask our um, our leadership team, prayer team, not just for time, we won't, we won't close the worship tonight, but at least our prayer team, our leadership team, kind of just prayer team. That if you are here tonight, and man, your heart is not connected and surrendered to Jesus, you're like, man, I, I need to, like, I need to repent of my sins, I need to connect and surrender my heart to Jesus. Like, I'm done trying to please people, I'm done, done trying to put on an outwardly appearance, done trying to do any of that. This is your moment. This is your time to change your eternal destination. This is your time to have a miracle happen in your life, go from death to life. To, to come talk to any of these people, come talk to me, any of these people. We'd love to pray with you, we'd love to walk with you, to talk with you, to answer any questions. So you are here tonight. You're already a Christian, you're already calling Jesus. Awesome. Man, don't get caught up in this statistic. Don't get caught in the game of, hey, I can just appease people or achieve God's approval by doing these good things. Keep maturing your faith and let good things be the byproduct of that. I'm going to pray for us. If you have any questions, you may have talked through anything, please come talk to any of us.